YouTube channel, J. Let's go! Hello again, wrestling fans, and welcome to another edition of the Good Friends Better Enemies Podcast. My name is Jay, and I'm joined, of course, by my WrestleMania 38 counterpart, Mr. Tyrone. Tyrone, how you doing, Pally? You know, this is the first time I'm ready to actually talk about wrestling since WrestleMania. I think the hang the quote unquote WrestleMania hangover may finally be gone. We when, when last week's show came out, we had said we hadn't watched yet. It hadn't aired yet. Well, it's aired. Today, today's date is Sunday, April the whatever the hell it is, 10th, I believe. We're recording this the day before it drops. And my God, for the first time in a week, I think I can actually handle some wrestling talk. Oh, you know what? It's so funny you say that because I we didn't talk about this off air, Tyrone, just for a listening audience. And I feel the exact same way. I was so burnt out after WrestleMania weekend. I mean, I think the anticipation for me kind of peaked before the actual event. So by the time I got to WrestleMania, it was a little bit anticlimactic for me. I mean, I love the show, but um, this whole week I've been binge watching Star Trek and just completely out of the realm of wrestling just to kind of uh, almost give my mind a palate cleanse. So I'm right there with you. Even making the notes for the show this week was... You know, I was having to really get myself into a framework or a frame of mind to, to, to watch some wrestling. So, but, you know, as it is, when you and I get together, we tend to talk about the business and rebook the territory. So I am at the same point as you ready to dive back into the world of sports entertainment. Well, let's talk about that thing known as WrestleMania weekend, Jay. Let's start with the Hall of Fame. What? What can we say about this? I mean, I know you've probably got a laundry list of items that you want to talk about when it comes to The Undertaker's speech that uh, I'm just going to say straight up, he's kind of got the Tony Robbins self-motivator, self, uh, what the fuck is the term I'm looking for here? Somebody who's, they just, like a self-motivating speaker, is that what it is? Motivational speaker, there we go. That was the vibe I got from that man. That entire speech, the fact that he had the little side microphone on, he was walking around, telling some stories, but also kind of trying to be inspirational and tell people to never give up on their dreams. I liked the speech a lot, thought that it could have trimmed some things, not saying it needed to be shorter because you do want a long speech for somebody like that. But before we fully get into that, there were the other speeches. I thought the Steiners were really fucking weird. I thought that it looked like Scott was going into business for himself for a second and Rick was a little upset. Didn't really like that. Uh, Charmel's was fine. Vader didn't get enough as far as I'm concerned. He should have got a much longer speech as well, such as The Undertaker. And I am drawing a blank on who the other... Was it just Shad? Was Shad the other one or am I missing somebody? No, it was Shad. It was Shad's fault. I thought the Shad thing was beautiful. I loved how his family came out. I loved how JTG came out. They did the little crime time handshake fist bump jump thingy that they would do loved it but you go now i kind of just gave my two cents you tell me what you thought well i, I kind of feel the same way as you do for some of it um i do think the undertaker speech was really good i really enjoyed it um I, I thought that it was very timely it wasn't what i was expecting which i think was nice as well i, I didn't feel that it went on too long in fact i could have listened to another hour Um, but I mean, of course that's what it is with the hall of fame speeches. It really depends, I think on your level of connection with the performer. Uh, there are some speeches where sometimes they go, um, a little long and I mean, it's very interesting to hear the stories, but sometimes I feel like certain performers are a little bit long for me in terms of their speech, maybe because I'm not as connected to them, uh, from a, uh, or they're not a they might not be the best storytellers like a Bob Backlund or or a Mr. T. I know we keep going back to those two, but those are the two that you really think about when you hear long winded speeches. Yeah, but, you know, sometimes with the longer speeches, sometimes they can be a little bit endearing. I mean, I think about Hillbilly Jim and his speech was so long, but the truth of it is I wasn't upset with it because I just think that he's such an endearing character that it was like and at a certain part, it almost or rather a certain point. 
it almost becomes comical. Like I remember the the 2005 Hall of Fame with the Iron Sheik, and he just kept on going and going and going, and eventually the crowd but, was just in hysterics. Yeah, I do. I do remember that too. Uh, one little thing I forgot to bring up about the Hall of Fame that I I did text you throughout WrestleMania weekend and said that he may have been my MVP for the entire weekend. That's Booker T. His commitment to all hail Queen Charmel throughout her entire entrance, going all the way, even when he wasn't mic'd up, helping her up the stairs, still saying it. I loved every second of that. It shows how much that man just adores his wife. I thought it was absolutely great. No, I enjoyed that portion of it as well. Um, I thought that her speech was good. I think it was the appropriate length. Um, I do agree with you. Vader's could have been a little bit longer, but I understand why. I mean, it's the posthumous speech. And sometimes when it's not a person that's there in person to be inducted um, for whatever reason, I understand why they keep it a little bit more brief. Um, as far as Shad Gaspar's speech, I thought that uh, it would rival The Undertaker's in terms of that speech I thought was phenomenal. His wife gave. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, so, so all in all, I'd say it was a really good class. And I do agree the Steiners was a little bit um, odd. But I kind of feel like this is the way we should go from now on with these Hall of Flames. Let's keep the class down to like four or five people. And then from there, you can still give people time to speak. You know, the Undertaker went a pr- pretty close to an hour, I think. Um, and I'm fine with that. If you keep it shorter and then you have maybe a two-hour program, you give the headliner a little bit longer to, to speak, and then you give everybody else some time as well. I think that that's the way we should do it from now on. Let's not try to shoehorn, you know, eight to ten people in each class. And I think we should also get rid of this. Um, I don't remember exactly what it's called now. I don't know. if Is it the Legacy Award? It's not the Warrior Award. I think it's the Legacy Award where they, they kind of put in uh, legends of the past without giving them a speech or anything. I think we should do away with that as well. Well, they didn't do it this year, so I think it might be gone, which is good because to me it diminishes a solo spot in the Hall of Fame for somebody like a Luna Vachon or Bruiser Brody. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to WrestleMania Night One and talk about some of the things that we thought there. First of all, Rick Boogs, that injury, that looked fucking terrible when it happened. It has come out that he has torn his quad patella. He is probably out, I would assume, for close to a year. I, I mean, that was what Trips was out for. Unless he's like Vince and he's just a goddamn maniac and he's back in a couple of months. Yeah, it was uh, it was gruesome, definitely. I mean, at first, um, when I saw it, I wasn't sure if he was selling only because they kept the camera on him for it. So I wasn't 100% sure whether or not he was selling. Um, but, you know, it was an incredible feat of strength. It reminded me of the uh, the Cena spot from wrestlemania 25 um i do feel as though you know it was just such an unfortunate way to start that the event based on the fact that someone got injured obviously Mm -hmm. we wish him the best but uh the match was what it was obviously once that happened uh, all bets were off but um i thought it was the idea of it was a fun opener i like a good tag team match to open up yeah i I wasn't upset with that either it was just the match definitely suffered and I think had to end a little quickly due to obviously the injury. I don't know if that was the original outcome or if they were planning on changing the titles. I doubt it, but we'll never know. Um, Baron Corbin, surprising. Baron Corbin put on a hell of a show. God damn, I love that man. Yeah, he's a uh, he's a solid hand uh, and his character... Um... I don't know. I kind of like the character right now, but I wouldn't mind so much if he went back to the sad Corbin as well. I mean, if we sort of went to this, um, like this yo-yo of him having ebbs and flows with his luck might be fun as well. I don't hate the character. I think the character is, is interesting. It reminds me a bit of the cartoonish type, uh, you know, late eighties or mid eighties wrestling type character. But I do feel like we need to now move on from from Baron Corbin and, and uh, Drew Drew McIntyre. I think that Drew McIntyre needs to get reheated, and uh, I wouldn't necessarily mind to see him in the title picture again sometime in the summer. Well, we see he's going up with Sami Zayn next. We saw that on SmackDown, so we kind of know what the direction is there. They're gonna. It looks like they're gonna put like a few mid to upper mid guys in his path. He's gonna go through them and then end up probably a, a, against Reigns down the line. 
Yeah, it could very well be. I'm not really sure where they're going with him. I just think that, you know, I always go back to this when we talk about Roman or uh, Drew McIntyre, you and I on this podcast and even um, in our personal lives that he was so hot after that Royal Rumble win in 2020. And of course, you know, COVID was something that nobody could have predicted or, or uh, managed at the time. So I just feel like if we were trying to get McIntyre hot again, if we get him back to that level that he was, because again, you know, that, that Brock Lesnar drew McIntyre match was something that I'd been anticipating for years. And I think that we were kind of robbed of a really solid outing based on the parameters of the uh, performance center WrestleMania. I think that in front of a crowd, that match would be a barn burner. Let's talk about that in a little bit when we talk about Brock Lesnar, because I want to circle back around to that, but let's, talk about the American nightmare making his return we all knew it was coming but at the same time there was still some doubt I'm not gonna lie I was sitting there watching it live going it's got to be Cody right it's got to be Cody and then the lights went out and I went oh my god are they fucking doing Undertaker and literally had a moment where I was ready to turn off the tv until Kingdom played I got so pumped for this I was so amped up for this I truly think that his pop is the only one that rivals Stone Cold Steve Austin's of the whole weekend. No? Sorry, I I thought it was good. Um, I enjoyed it as well. I just don't think that I'm on the same level of Cody fandom as a lot of people. I, I think that there are a lot of people that are um, very excited about the prospect of Cody coming back to the company. And I do think that there is a large segment of the audience that really feel like this is the first shot fired by WWE in response to AEW by bringing in a, um, a major star from the opposition, which not I understand. A, not a major star, but a founding father. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, for those reasons, it's very exciting. Um, I guess in my mind with Cody, I feel like it's going to be a wait and see for me. Um, I personally don't know at this point if it's going to lose a little bit of its luster down the road. Is he going to continue to be someone that is on the top of the card and is they going to be pushing him to be uh, one of the faces of the company? Or are we going to be looking back on this, you know, in the latter part of the summer and think, okay, well, he's kind of settled into being in the crowd with the rest of the um, mid higher mid card, upper mid card to main event players like a Seth Rollins type um, type character. So I have a wait and see approach right now. I think that they are going to try everything they can to keep him quite, uh, quite hot. But at the same time, I mean, I will be honest with you and I'm not trying to be negative here whatsoever. Um, I did notice that even on Monday, the Raw after Mania, I mean, it might be the burnout from the two nights of Mania, but I found that his pop was very lackluster on Raw. On Monday, it was, I will give you that, it wasn't the biggest pop. On Saturday, it was the second biggest pop of the night, though. I think it had a bigger pop than Undertaker when he came out for the Hall of Fame, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. But what you said about him being an upper middle card, will he get lost in the shuffle with the Seth Rollins, things like that. Now that the titles are unified, if they are planning on keeping them as one, then the title will not just be the only main event. Because if they're going to have Roman go strong for potentially a year or two, depending what's going on with The Rock, you can't just have the title be the only main event. You need to have your Seth Rollins, your Cody Rhodes, your Kevin Owens, your Sami Zayn, your Drew McIntyres in the other main event to keep the flow of the show going. That way it's not always just like, Uh, Who the fuck is Roman going to beat this week? Who's up to him now? Is anyone ever going to beat him? No, we have other shows going on. We have other uh, storylines going on to keep us interested in the product still. Well, I think that that was the idea of the initial brand split back in 2002. If you think about it, we only had one champion up until September when uh, when Triple H got the World Heavyweight Championship from Eric Bischoff. And I kind of like the idea of Reigns going from show to show and having different obstacles on both brands. Uh, I think that that's a smart way to do it if you're going to keep the titles unified, which I think they should do for a, for a period of time now. If you want to somehow break them apart down the road, I guess you can come up with a scenario to do that. But 
for those reasons, I mean, if you keep somebody really hot on SmackDown and somebody really hot on Raw, and then Reigns has to kind of fend between the two. And then at some point, maybe you do a triple threat match between all three. That might be a fun way to go as well. But um, if they're the gonna point keep, is... If they're going to keep the titles unified, then the U.S. title and the IC title need to be built way up again so that they mean something and that there's always a championship for somebody to be a contender to. Oh, I agree with that. I agree 100%. At least the Intercontinental, I think that that needs to definitely be be raised. And and so maybe that's the thinking with Drew McIntyre. Maybe he ends up uh, down the road uh, holding on to that title and reestablishing it as the quote-unquote workhorse title. Um, as far as Cody goes again, I mean, I thought it was a great moment. Obviously, having uh, the opportunity to see it live on uh, WWE Network was you know, a magical moment. I can only imagine what it must have been like in the actual stadium. I've been at AT&T, AT&T Stadium. It's, uh, it's an amazing facility. So I can only imagine what the atmosphere must have been like. And, I, and again, I'm not trying to be negative on Cody. I think that uh, he brings a lot to the table. I just hope that this ends up becoming what they all envision it to be as opposed to settling into kind of something a little bit less than which historically has happened in the past. So it's a wait and see for me. Fair enough. All right. Uh, I still want to talk about a bunch of shit of WrestleMania and we have a full show ahead of us though. So let's keep moving a bit here. Uh, Bianca and Becky Lynch, honestly, to, in my opinion, second best match or sorry, third best match of all of WrestleMania, second best match of that night. I thought they were fantastic. I thought the entrances was great. I thought they both looked incredible. Their gear, their hair, everything about this match was perfect to me. Yeah, um, I have a little bit of a bitter, a different take on it. I thought the match was good. I don't think it's as good as most people seem to think it was. I, I'm not saying it was bad. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it. But I just, it was a match for me. I don't think that it was match of the night. Um, really even match of the weekend, I don't think. I mean, it was it was there for me. The story was there for me. Um, it might have just been, the, you know, my feelings at the time. Maybe I should go back and watch it again. Uh, I just, I remember watching it at the time and thinking, uh, this is this is okay, but it's not. It wasn't something that really just blew my mind. In fact, I will say truthfully, Tyrone, I don't think in ring wise this weekend there was much that really did blow me away. So oh, we're gonna uh, get to that. We're gonna get to that. Don't you worry, um, because I feel like up next is the segment that blew Jay off of his couch and had him cracking some broken skull beers, spilling it all over his lovely girlfriend and constantly asking her what when she didn't even ask a goddamn question. But here we are, Kevin Owens, Stone Cold Steve Austin, turned into a no-holds-barred match, not even a fucking KO show segment. Jay, talk to it. Talk to me about it. I know this was probably your favorite part of the whole weekend. I thought that, uh, I thought that we were going to talk about Charlotte and Ronda. We're going to get there. Okay. All right. You want to talk about that this first? Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, me well enough to know that this was absolutely my highlight of the weekend. Um, I thought he did a tremendous job being, he being Steve Austin. I thought that he looked really good. Uh, somebody that I was uh, speaking with, or rather I had listened to, to some programming earlier in the week had mentioned that you could almost see Steve Austin shedding the skin, almost like a rattlesnake, shedding the skin of 19 years of not being in the ring. You could see it in real time happening that, you know, it started off that's tiniest bit slow uh, in terms of what was going on in the ring. And then suddenly Austin just fired up and it was like we turned back the hands of time. I absolutely adored this. He was taking suplexes on concrete on the stage, uh, you know, taking bumps hitting stunners. Uh, I just thought it was so well done. Uh, I know that you had mentioned to me off air uh, a couple of, couple of days ago that people online have been talking about how it's, you know, akin to Goldberg coming back. I don't think it could be further from the truth. Uh, in fact, everything that I've read online has been very, very high on it. And I think that it was, I thought it was absolutely the most tremendous portion of the weekend. On top of that, I mean, that pop Tyrone, come on. Okay, I will never argue the pop. I will say I was impressed with the amount that Austin did. I thought it was going to be 
couple of couple of stomps, couple of punches. I mean, I'm not don't get me wrong. There were parts like you said it started off rusty. He was doing his mud hole stomp in the corner. It did not look good at all. But the longer it went, the better it got. I think that we really, really, really have to say that Kevin Owens was probably the best possible choice for the opponent because he made Austin look even better than he he would have looked on his own. And you you know that that is the goddamn truth. Oh, absolutely, I do. Uh, I definitely think so. Um, I don't think that necessarily the stomps in the beginning of the match were because Austin was slow. I think it had to do with the way he was delivering them because I thought the same thing at first uh, watching it and thinking, why is he stomping so slow? And then I just realized I watched the match a second time and thought, okay, no, no, no. he's just doing that to get a reaction from the crowd rather than uh, his old obligatory stomps. Again, I, I think that when you see the match progress, there's a moment in the match where Austin just starts walking around and talking trash like he used to. Um, and he was just phenomenal in this. I mean, you can't, I don't think you can say enough about how well he did considering he hadn't been in a ring in almost 20 years. It's, it's, it's a feat of, of excellence in my mind. Now, one question I have for you, Tyrone is, do you think this is it? Is this absolutely it? Or do you think yes. we're going to see another Steve Austin? No, this is, it. this is it. This is a hundred percent. It. They did it because he started his career in Dallas at the Sportatorium, and now he can say he finished his career in Dallas at AT AT&T Stadium. He's done. He's almost 60 years old. I feel like this was him going out on his terms, finally. Austin's done. Yeah, I I think so, too. I do agree with that. I don't think it could have gone any better. Um, It's almost like, to me, in a weird way, almost like the Boneyard match with Taker. Like, Mm -hmm. could Taker do another match? Probably. But at the same time... You know, we nobody, saw him at that extreme pay per view um, with Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre and um, and Roman Reigns, and he looked phenomenal in that match. He was moving around so quickly; he looked so great. Uh, then he does the Boneyard match, and I think at a certain point, it's like, okay, like it's not going to get any higher than this, so let's just call it a day. Yeah, I I think that that's a totally fair statement. Um, and also, nobody else wants to see Undertaker in a match except for you. I will go on record saying that. Um, but you asked earlier, are we going to talk about Charlotte and Ronda? I don't need to because it was the most predictable outcome of the evening. So if you have anything to say on it, you can. But I'm ready to skip it. I don't really have much to say about it. I think that um, something that you had mentioned before WrestleMania where you would have preferred to see Ronda and Becky, I do agree with you there. I think that... Uh, uh, I know that we're going to see this match again. I think it's an I quit stick coming up at the next pay-per-view. And, you know, mm-hmm. it is what it is. I just, you know, I don't know. I, I feel for me that Charlotte's a bit overexposed for me at this point. I think she's, what, a 13 or 14-time champion at this point. Talked about it a number of times. It took her dad, you know, 35 years to to achieve those accolades. It's taken her six. So I just feel like it's a little bit too much for me with Charlotte. She's a phenomenal athlete. But I think that we need to cool our jets on her a little bit. Let's move on to night two. And let's talk about the person who they really want us to love already. And that is Mr. Gable Steveson. They were pulling out a lot of stops for this man. First night one, they kind of had Stephanie come out, introduce him on the stage. Night two, end of the tag team title match. He's in the ring drinking beer with Orton, Riddle, and the, um, the Street Profits. There's not a lot known about this guy unless you are a collegiate NCAA wrestling fan. He's an Olympic medalist. He is a phenomenal uh, amateur wrestler, but they're already trying to give him the the Kurt Angle treatment. And I'm wondering, was this done on, on purpose so that you have Chad Gable going with Gable Steveson to have Gable versus Gable down the line? Is, is that what they were thinking or did that just end up being a happy accident? I think that maybe you're putting the cart ahead of the horse a little bit there. I don't know that he's even at a point right now where he'd be ready to compete anytime in the near future. I do agree with you. Um, Seeing what they did with him on that particular weekend with a Stephanie, the first night. And then of course, you know, the second night as well, um, they were really pushing. In fact, I even said to my girlfriend, I was like, wow, they have big plans for this guy. Clearly. 
Um, but I, I, I want to talk about something else real quick before we go to that. Is yeah. I really Look. like the way we opened WrestleMania night two with Triple H coming in and leaving his boots in the ring and welcoming us, welcoming us to WrestleMania. I thought that that was a really nice touch, and I thought it was really, really awesome for Triple H to get that huge pop in front of a hundred thousand or seventy thousand, I guess, um, for night two. I thought that was a great way to start the show. Thousand J is the real number. What's that? 63,000 is the real number, but uh, yeah, I thought that was that was a very nice thing. It was nice to see, see Trips come out one last time, leave his boots in the ring, get the pop, get emotional. Thought it was perfect. Um, it was what it needed to be. He didn't take up really any time other than his entrance. He didn't really say anything. He just got the show started. Yeah, exactly. So I thought it was a nice touch. Now, when it comes to night two... In my opinion, and I know you are probably going to argue this to me to the death, the MVP of night two, maybe even the entire fucking weekend was Sami Zayn. The fact that he made Knoxville look as good as he did, not only Knoxville, but he was taking body slam bumps from Wee Man. He had Pontius dancing naked around him. He had the entire crew with without Steve-O for some reason. I don't get why he wasn't there. But the Jackass boys were in a WrestleMania match that ended with Johnny Knoxville pulling out a six-foot mousetrap to trap Sami Zayn in for the pin. That is correct, people. Johnny Knoxville got a win over Sami Zayn at WrestleMania, but I I don't have anything negative to say about this like I thought I would. I was thoroughly entertained during that whole match from bell to bell. Yeah, I thought that the match actually was, uh, was entertaining for what it was. Um... I will say that I think that for you to get a real kind of deep, visceral feeling regarding the match, you kind of had to be a bit of a jackass fan, which I've never been. Oh, wow. uh, I've, I've never really even watched that much of it. I've seen clips here and there. So, uh, I mean, I think that for the casual fan of jackass like myself i'm not even a casual fan i'm not really even familiar with it only the person i knew was johnny knoxville i didn't know the other the other uh members of the jackass crew um i thought that it was an entertaining match i like the al snow bowling ball spot from uh, the attitude era was fun um the giant hand was i don't know it was it was really over the top but at the same time um, the no, way that they shot it with the camera, so you didn't see it for the whole match, and then suddenly the giant hand. That's one of their, that's was one of their famous cool. bits from a movie. Was they did that to everybody? They would slingshot them with a giant hand when they came around a corner, and no one saw it coming. So it was fucking perfect. Okay, see, I didn't know that reference. So this, like, I grew up as a jackass fan. I grew up in that era. I grew up watching all the movies, watching the TV shows with a camcorder, saying, "Hey, I'm Tyrone, and welcome to Jackass," and doing that stupid shit. But this was brilliant this to me was way better than logan paul we didn't touch on logan paul in night one i wasn't sure if i wanted to but the fact that he did that eddie guerrero spot honestly got him so much heat even with me i was physically angry when he did that yeah i you know what? i will say he did a good job he was good in ring he was in shape he was moving around well he was executing spots in a really really tight way um, I don't have anything negative to say about his in-ring work. I just am not a fan of 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 the personality. Um, obviously, the, the 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 character that he's portraying, which is quite close to the vest in terms of who he is on social media as well. Uh, oh, I will just say it: he is a piece of shit. <laughs> well, I I don't know. I've never met the guy, so I don't know. A lot of times, Tyrone people play characters, and then when you actually meet I, them and talk with them one on one, they're quite different. I, I don't even want to give the guy a time of day, him or his brother, to meet them because they seem like such pieces of shit. You ever want to just know something about the Paul brothers? Google them in the suicide woods in Japan, and that's all you'll ever need to know. Okay, I think I'm good, but uh, I appreciate the uh, the uh, the suggestion. Well, while uh, we're talking about this, let's get the other celebrity match out of the way, too, and let's talk about Pat McAfee and Austin Theory and then obviously what it turned into. I mean... Pat McAfee's a professional athlete. It shouldn't have shocked me how well he did, but it fucking shocked. When he did the leap up to the top row for the suplex, I jumped out of my chair. Yeah, I see this for me, I think, was a little bit more than the moment of night two than uh, the jackass stuff. And again, 
I thought the the match with Knoxville and Zane was really, really good. It was fun. It was entertaining. It was campy. It was all the things that professional wrestling can be in a certain presentation. Uh, so I, I did enjoy that. Um, this particular match I thought was was good. I mean, it was a really solid outing by both guys. Uh, you have to give a lot of credit to Austin Theory as well for, for mm-hmm. helping to carry McAfee. But I don't think that McAfee needed much carrying. He was doing really well in the match. Um, there's no part of this that I didn't think was fun. I mean, people are making fun of Vince being in the match and this and that and thinking it's not necessary. No, it wasn't necessary. We all know that. But you know what? It's to me almost like the same thing as the Jackass match. I mean, I feel like it wasn't necessary. No, but it was fun. And the fact that Vince screwed up the stunner, whatever, who cares? Oh, no, 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 no. That was the greatest thing ever. Like, when Austin can't even keep it together because he knows how fucking bad it was, that was that was one of the highlights of the show. Now, did you catch the little Easter egg that happened during that segment, though? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Stone Cold Steve Austin's music hit at exactly three hours and 16 minutes into night two. Uh, I heard about that. Yeah, I didn't catch it when I was watching the show. I heard about it afterwards. That's but one I, of the things that the Twitter statisticians come up with. It was so fucking cool. I, I can't believe that me, who hates the part-timers and all that, is sitting here saying, I loved every second of this. I thought that the use of Pat McAfee, the use of Vince McMahon, the use of Steve Austin, Austin Theory taking the stunner like a champion, the the visual of Pat McAfee laying on the ground outside the ring, pouring beer into his own mouth. Everything about this whole thing was perfect. Yeah, I uh, and I wasn't expecting Austin as well. I know a lot of people were saying, oh, when Vince got in the ring, I knew Austin was coming out. I had no idea he was going to be there for night two. I was completely shocked by it. Um, and so when I saw it, I got really excited. Of course, you know, you get to see him twice. And I think it's great for the fans as well. If for whatever reason you weren't able to be in attendance live for night one to get Austin on night two, I think is really, really solid for the fans. Um, Again, something I wasn't, I wasn't expecting. I thought it was, I thought it was really fun. It was a great, um, a great little spot for WrestleMania. And of course, going back to yesteryear. And then on top of that as well, I mean, you had a really solid match beforehand. So the fact that McAfee lost to Vince, I mean, it's who cares? It's not going to be a thing that anybody thinks about when they think about this this spot in in uh, years going forward. They're all, all they're going to think about is how fun it was, and they're going to think about Austin and, and and Vince and and beer and all that kind of thing. So, uh, Edge AJ, my God, you want to talk a fucking great match? You go back and watch that. That was hard hitting. From the moment AJ came out after he, what we found out after is he cut his face on the, the stage, on the, the set. I was sitting there with my wife watching it, and she fully thought somebody had cheap shot at him before. And that's why he was so angry and intense throughout the whole thing. And I was like, well, that's perfect. That is almost, that almost made this even better. There's more, ambi- there's no, there's more involvement in this now like people who don't understand what's going on my wife's not really a fan is watching this going oh my god this is real something happened i thought this match was incredible every fucking detail from edge's entrance even to the end of having damian priest come out and building this new stable with them i love every second of it yeah uh this for me was sort of the same thing as uh Becky and um, Bianca, I I think it was a little bit underwhelming for me. Uh, again, I need to go back and watch some of these matches uh, through the course of WrestleMania weekend. You know, you're sitting there, you're watching a lot of wrestling, you're you're enjoying yourself, you're having a couple drinks, you're eating some food, all the rest of it. So it might be that I just need to watch it, watch it rather with a fresh pair of eyes. Um, I think. As I alluded to before, WrestleMania for me this year was almost anticlimactic because my excitement level had peaked a day or two before the actual event. So I need to give it another look over. Uh, I do remember the match being quite good, but I don't think it was ever from in my mind from what where I was sitting. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Not to say it was bad, but um, I just need to watch it again. I think I think basically my excitement for Austin coming back trumped everything else for this WrestleMania. So I need to go back and rewatch the event now that I've gotten that out of my system. Yeah, that's fair. I I completely understand that. I mean, I will say that this is the first time in 
many, many years, I watched an entire WrestleMania sober. So I don't know if that's why I enjoyed it so much more. <laughs> but yeah, uh, until we got to this point of the show, and I am talking about the main event, the most built up WrestleMania main event in a long time. And what happened? Same thing we thought was going to happen. It was lackluster. It was some suplexes. It was some spears. There was really nothing great about this match. You may disagree, but I thought this was one of the weakest things of the entire weekend. I don't, I don't think that my expectations were low going into this. I actually thought it was going to be a much different match. I think there's been a lot of talk that Reigns popped his shoulder, which might have made the, the match go home early. I'm not sure. It was a short match. I think but, it was less than 10 minutes. It feels like see, here's, it. Here's the thing is like, I didn't have low expectations going to this either. I thought it was going to be a great match, but it's a Brock Lesnar main event. And I know I say this and you always argue that he can go and he can do this. He can, but will he? This is why I wanted to bring back around what you were talking about with him and Drew McIntyre earlier. Would it have been a great match or would it again just be a six minute like that's it and WrestleMania? I just yeah, I don't think it, think it would have been go. I think it would have been a better match had it been in front of an audience. Um, I think it would have been a longer match. I don't think that this match ended the way it was supposed to. I think that Reigns was intended to go over, which I think was the right call. Uh, it's not going to hurt Brock any. You can take Brock and put him in any program you want going forward whenever he decides to come back. Um, as far as this particular outing, I think that there's something, I, again, I think it's something to do with, with Rain's shoulder. I, I don't know firsthand, but that's what I'm hearing from a lot of different uh, outlets, news outlets. Um, I think the match was intended to be more than it was. To me, it was almost as if the match was just starting to heat up and then we just suddenly went home. That's how it felt to me. I mean, you did hear Rain say during the match that his shoulder was out. and They were saying on commentary that they think he just popped it back in. I don't know whether or not that was true or whether it was just for the match. I just know that I was highly disappointed with this and then realized I don't know why I was disappointed because this was probably what it was going to be. That, But overall, Jay, I got to say WrestleMania 38, I was going to give it... Going into it, I had maybe a 4 out of 10 peak interest. Coming out of it, I'd give it a solid 7.5 or 8. I'd say this is probably the best WrestleMania probably since 31. I think it's probably the best WrestleMania of the last... Oh, it's in probably the top 2 or 3 of the last 10 years. So yeah. I think it was a really, really good show. And I think, again, to your point, I think there's a lot of people that were not expecting a lot going into it i think that they uh really over delivered with a lot of stuff and i think that's part of the reason going back to the austin stuff why it was so great was because we didn't know for certain what we were going to get so when we got a match it was like what an incredible bonus mm -hmm. and then we got monday night raw with the debut of ezekiel but we'll talk about that another day yeah, exactly. So all in all, I, I agree with you. I think that WrestleMania 38 was uh, was a really solid outing. Uh, it's one of those manias where I feel like, okay, how do you top this next year? You have some some manias where you're like, okay, they're going to for sure do better next year. This one was so solid that it's going to be interesting to see where they go next year in Los Angeles. Well, I think that we have spent more than enough time talking about current product and it's time to do what we do on this show and that is get back in our little time machine open up the delorean and go back in time to a either favorite or least favorite wrestling event of both of ours and this week jay we are talking about wcw uncensored 1999 now originally it was going to be spring stampede and jay was going to try and hybrid them in together but it was a big order. It was a lot. It was WrestleMania hangover week. So we are just going to separate them. And if you don't like that, guess what, guys? It's our show. Suck it. Um, so we're doing WCW. It was March 14th, 1999 from Louisville, Kentucky at the Freedom Hall. Now, coming off of this, we had already booked WCW Super Brawl 9. And in that event, we had typical J booking. <laughs> where we had Goldberg defeat Ric Flair for the, for the WCW World Championship. We had Hulk Hogan and Diamond Dallas Page, where it was a rarity that Hogan lost, and DDP got the win. 
You had the Filthy Animals of Rey Mysterio and Conan going up against the Outsiders and picking up that win. Chris Jericho defeating Rowdy Roddy Piper for the WCW United States Championship. Two out of three falls match, WCW Tag Team Champions. The soon-to-be West Texas Rednecks with Kurt Henning and Barry Windham against the four horsemen, Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko. Guess what? New Tag Team Champions came out of that one. We also had the World Television Championship between Scott Steiner and Booker T ending in a no contest. So I feel like that's going to show up somewhere down here. We had Bam Bam Bigelow and Billy Kidman in a fun little match. And we had Raven and Canyon taking on Fit Finley and Dave Taylor with Raven and Canyon taking the win. I know I started at the main event and went my way down, but guess what, guys? I like the opening cards usually a lot better than the main event when it comes to WCW of this time. Yes, sir. So we did have some interesting story threads going through uh, this particular event. Tyrone, if you don't mind, I know you have the notes in front of you. Could you just maybe give our listening audience the polls notes of how we ended WCW Super Brawl? We sure can. We ended it with, hold on, let me pull up the notes a little bit better here. Going off the air backstage, Eric Bischoff is leading David Flair into a Hummer after he took, after he had developed. Wow, what is the word I am looking for there? Let's start again. He takes David Flair to a limo. They're popping champagne, and there is an empty seat with Hulk Hogan already in there after he betrayed Ric Flair. That is the word I'm looking for. There you go, sir. There you go, indeed. So, uh, I think that we're ready to get back in our time machine, go back to party like it's 1999, and uh, get into uncensored from freedom hall louisville kentucky march 14th 1999 what is on the card my friend and let's get into this humdinger well our opening contest on the original card is billy kidman defending the wcw cruiserweight championship against mikey whipwreck which i gotta say that's a name you don't really associate with wcw well the opening contest on WCW Uncensored is for the WCW Cruiserweight Championship and it is for uh or rather it is your champion Billy Kidman your champion defending against Mikey Whipwreck and the match is staying the same. Yeah, I got it. That's a good choice, solid opener. You don't really see Mikey Whipwreck in WCW very often even though he was there. I just kind of forget about it. But yeah, I like both of these guys. Great match. Billy Kidman, always one of my favorites. Mikey Whipwreck, I don't talk enough about him. I love him. So, yeah, I'm I'm cool with us starting this off like that. Yeah, I think it was a good match. I, I watched it yesterday um, in, in preparation for this event. Uh, it was sort of an unusual style. It was a little bit different than the typical cruiserweight style that you'd get on a WCW uh, pay-per-view. So I thought that some of the... Um, unorthodox offense and countering of the moves that Whipwreck did with Kidman was it made it made you know they say styles make fights and I feel like for this particular match it was uh, it was really really well worked so let's just keep it as it is all right well let's go on to the next one which I'm really fucking hoping is not here anymore and we had Stevie Ray going up against Vincent in a Harlem street fight for the leadership of the NWO black and white that's where the goddamn black and white was at this time folks Virgil and Booker T's brother fighting over it. Uh, the next match on the card is for the WCW World Tag Team Championship, and it is Kurt Henning and Barry Windham defending against Raven and Canyon. Okay, okay, yep, let's go. Tell me all about it. Okay, so in recent weeks, Raven has begun warming up to Canyon. Well, as much as Raven could. Canyon is still carrying the team in ring, but Raven has begun tagging more and more weekly. Following the team's big victory at Super Brawl, a tag team title opportunity looms. Raven and Canyon continue their winning ways heading into Super Brawl. At the pay-per-view, it is very well worth match. Henning and Wyndham have isolated Canyon for much of the contest. Raven seems his usual unaffected self. In a scene seemingly from Return of the Jedi, suddenly Raven returns and clears the ring moments before Canyon is dispatched of. With Raven firing up on the champions, Canyon is left to collect himself. The champions gain the upper hand once more, with Wyndham hitting a lariat. Henning gets tagged in and is stopped short by a hard right to his belly by Raven. Following 
a drop toll hold. Raven then hits a forearm smash on Wyndham. As Raven turns to finish off Henning, he walks into his uh, Henning Plex for the pin. Your winners and still WCW World Tag Team Champions, Kurt Henning and Barry Wyndham. After the match, Canyon looks on in disgust and makes his way backstage, leaving a dazed Raven in the ring. Um, okay, I'm cool with this. I see where the story's going. My only issue is I don't like Raven looking like the idiot in this. I get it. In the storyline, it makes sense. We'll get to a payoff, I'm sure, down the road. But and it, it just it's not the Raven character to ever be the one that is left behind being blamed and looking like a goof. Do you know what I mean? Well, for me, I think it's I kind of maybe I'm just realizing this now as I as we're talking about it. I think maybe what I did was I borrowed a little bit from what's going on with RK Bro right now. I kind of feel as though, you know, Canyon had been working with Raven to try to bring him out of this funk for months and months and months. And now finally Raven is starting to grow some admiration for Canyon. And then just as this happens, Canyon's just had enough. He's had enough of Raven's nonplus attitude about their matches. And that in his mind, the fact that he was left to wrestle the the lion's share of this match. And at the very last minute, Raven decides he gives a shit. Um, is too little too late for Canyon. He's had enough of it. I feel like what? that's the story. When did this happen with RK Bro? What did I miss? No, I'm just talking about I'm talking about how in the beginning it was sort of like oil and water. Like a Seamus and Cesaro. It's oil and water and then they suddenly gotcha. become you know, they start becoming more more friendly, right? Yeah, I mean it's it's almost as good as Team Haven with Raven and Maven, so it's fun. Yes, that's right. Team Haven indeed. All right, you ready for What's the next? What's next on the card, pal? Next up, we have Kevin Nash defeating Rey Mysterio. All righty. Well, the next match on our card is for the WCW World, or rather, United States Championship. It is your champion, Chris Jericho, defending against Ming. Oh, yeah. You got Ming on this card? Oh, that's Minging. I'm loving it. Um, fuck yeah. I ba, really... Ba, 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 ba. Yeah. I really want um, Ming over here, but I feel like I won't get that. So just just walk me through this. All right. So after defeating Piper at Super Brawl, Jericho is more arrogant than ever. The following night on Nitro, Jericho is backstage in the locker room. With nobody in sight, Jericho takes it upon himself to throw all of the luggage and property beside his locker onto the floor and into the trash, making room for his new title and sizable ego. A few segments later, Jericho is in the ring preparing for a non-title match with El Dandy when he cut, we cut to the dressing room. We discover that the discarded and desecrated property belongs to Ming. When Ming realizes what's happened and who is responsible, he beelines it to the ring. Jericho is oblivious to this and is arrogantly applying a rear chin lock on Dandy. We see a close-up on Jericho's face as Ming approaches. Jericho's face goes from confusion to terror as we, the audience, can seemingly read Jericho's thoughts in real time. As Ming enters the ring, Jericho releases the hold, takes a powder retrieving the title, and feeds Ralphus to Ming. In Michael Myers-like fashion, we see Ming stalk Jericho on the weeks leading to the pay-per-view on WCW programming, never managing to get his clutches on the U.S. champion. At the pay-per-view, Jericho has nowhere to hide. Ming applies a Tongan death grip on Ralphus when emerging to the ring, neutralizing him before the bout. It's a cat-and-mouse game. Ming hits thrusts and sidekicks as Jericho attempts to escape. Jericho rakes the eyes, momentarily gaining the upper hand. Jericho then grabs a chair from ringside and nails Ming for the disqualification. With little effect to Ming, Jericho again retrieves his title and escapes, leaving Ralphus on the floor unconscious. Ming is enraged and implies the death grip on the ref. Your winner by disqualification, Ming. All right. Well, I got him to win. That's nice. I just was hoping for a title change. Yeah, this is fine. Uh, I don't I don't hate it. I don't love it. It is what it is. I get the storyline. I see where we're going with it. It makes sense. Yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about it. Yeah, yeah that's fair enough. I just wanted to get Ming on the card. It's always fun to see who's on the roster in 99 WCW or even 98 or 97. So um, I thought it was a nice, nice little way to nice little way to get him on the card. And I also think that you can kind of, 
pseudo turn Ming baby face here. I mean, he's not a, he's not a full fledged baby face, but I think that people were so put off by Jericho's ego at this time that to have Ming kind of be like this guy, that's just going to kick his ass. I think a lot of people would have been behind that. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, up right. next, next we have, we had Jerry Flynn defeating Ernest Miller and Sony Ono in a handicap match. I, uh, I don't see this one stay. I love that you just call them Sony Ono. Yeah, I said that really, really weirdly. I realized after I was just like, I'm just going to let it go. Sonny Ono. We know who he is. Yeah. Samsung the Cat Miller. Okay, so we have WCW World Television Championship. Your champion, Scott Steiner, the big booty daddy, defending against Rey Mysterio. What's defending? You just said something funny there, too. I was just trying to help you out. I didn't want you to feel alone because I'm a friend. I'm your very dear, close, personal, longtime friend. And I didn't want you to feel by yourself in terms of mispronunciation. Fuck your face. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Whatever. Scott Snyder, Rey Mysterio TV title match. Cool. This sounds terrible. So I hope you make it good. After earning a pinfall victory alongside Conan over the Outsiders at Super Brawl, Mysterio is granted a title opportunity. Steiner is obviously furious. So much so that the Big Booty Daddy, along with NWO members, take out Conan in decisive fashion. Bray is left to fend for himself, but is able to evade frequent beatdown attempts by the group. On the go-home thunder, Ray would steal a victory over Brian Adams. At the pay-per-view, Mysterio is flying high. Opening the contest with a flurry of springboard offense, Steiner gains the upper hand by hitting a vicious Steiner line countering a springboard crossbody attempt. Steiner then takes control. Power move after power move. A press slam sends Ray over the top to the floor. Steiner taunts the crowd with push-ups and a bicep flex. Bagwell, who accompanies Steiner to the ring, rolls Mysterio back in the ring. Steiner hits yet another clothesline and a big-time power slam. Bagwell, now up on the apron taunts the crowd along with Steiner. As the oblivious duo bask in their dominance, Ray hits a dropkick on Steiner from behind, sending Bagwell sailing. As Steiner gains his bearings, Ray is poised on the top rope and lands a Hurricane Rana. Ray then lands a springboard leg drop and a jackknife cover for the pin. Your winner and new WCW television champion, Ray Mysterio. Ray gets his belt and beelines to the locker room as Bagwell and Steiner are enraged. So essentially, we're keeping like the the giant killer gimmick going that Rey Mysterio was going through at this point. I just felt like it, we were at a point where we could um, we could put the title on Rey. I think Signal's title, other than the cruiserweight, I think we were he was over enough at this point that let's just pull the trigger on it. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I mean, television championship is wasn't really anything crazy at this point. So yeah, I'm I'm all right with this. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much. What, well, uh, up, what do you have next? Up next, we have the match that I would probably want to watch the most on this card, and it is Hack, Bam Bam Bigelow, and Raven in a Falls Count Anywhere triangle match. Yeah. Uh, the next match on the card is actually a triangle match. It's Harlem Heat going up against the Outsiders, going up against Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko. Okay. Um... Why? Just just because? Or well, I'm going to explain it to you, pal. Uh, All right. Following the reunification of Harlem Heat at Super Brawl, which happened at Super Brawl Nine, we had had uh, Booker T be saved by Stevie Ray in the United States Championship match, and then later on in the contest, or rather the pay per view later on, they would hold off uh, Hall and Nash from interfering in the DDP and Hogan match. So we'd reform the Harlem Heat at Super Brawl. The NWO is out for blood. Things get complicated as the horsemen, having been beat down on Nitro following Super Brawl, take issue with Booker T and Stevie's claims that they're in the head of the line in regards to taking on the Outsiders. The two teams have a heated exchange the following week on Nitro. A very arrogant and confident Outsiders interrupt and suggest that both teams will get their wish. At Booker's suggestion, the match is now a triangle tag team match. The Heat and Horsemen break down into a brawl as the Outsiders look on in hysterics. A series of singles matches with members of all three teams take place on episodes of Thunder and Nitro leading to Uncensored. At the pay-per-view, Harlem Heat and the Horsemen are out first. With no Outsiders in sight, 
the two teams start the action. A very well-worked back-and-forth encounter. Benoit and Booker pick up right where the best of seven left off. Malenko was tagged and nails a drop kick on Stevie, sending him to the ap- off the apron to the outside. The Iceman lands a drop toe hold on Booker. Booker and Malenko hit double clotheslines on each other as a spent Benoit looks on crouched in the corner. Suddenly, the outsiders make their way down to ringside. With Nash laying out Stevie via a big boot in the aisleway, Hall has now entered the ring and hits a fallaway slam on Malenko, sending the Iceman over the top rope. Benoit enters and is greeted by a hard right hand from Hall. Nash enters and ki- hits a sidewalk slam on Booker. Hall and Nash t- take turns beating down Booker. Nash goes for the big boot again, only for Booker to evade, and Big Sexy has now laid out the ref. Hall cuts Booker off and hits a low blow. Nash is poised to hit the jackknife on Booker until Arn Anderson runs down the aisle, distracting Nash. Kevin throws Booker aside, taunting Arn to try him. Benoit nails a German from behind on Nash. Hall attempts to help Nash and is treated to a German of his own. As Hall is on the mat, a dazed Booker lands a Harlem hangover. Benoit is next with a diving headbutt. Stevie and Dean are taking their turns nailing Nash with hard right hands on the outside. Benoit then hits a series of Germans on Hall, followed by a scissors kick on Booker, or by Booker rather. As the ref comes to, he can see that this match is out of control. He calls for the bell. Members of the NWO make their way down to ringside in an effort to retrieve Hall and Nash. The Heat and Horsemen now have the high ground armed with chairs as the outsiders are, are assisted backstage by the likes of Norton, Vincent, and others. Anderson raises the hands of both teams standing between them in a show of unity by WCW. It's a no contest. Hmm. Okay. Um, I just don't like that we had a no contest on the last one, too. Like, it's WCW 99. You got a book within the time frame. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I mean, I did hate WCW 99. So, yeah, I'm not probably not going to like the majority of the, the rebooking of it either. Yeah, it is what it is, man. Again, I don't really have much to say. You laid it out, and I get why you did it, but I just don't like these finishes. That's fine. That's totally fine. Uh, what's next on the card? Well, up next was Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko going up against Kurt Henning and Barry Windham in a, for the Tag Team Championship. So, I mean, what do we have in its place? Next match on the card is Ric Flair and Diamond Dallas Page going up against Hollywood Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff, and David Flair. Okay. Um, okay, <laughs> yeah. Again, WCW 99. Sure, why the fuck not? What, what are we doing here, bro? All right, so the night following Super Brawl, Hogan and Bischoff emerge solo. There's no NWO in sight. Hogan makes the big introduction, and out comes David Flair. David cuts the promo you would expect, citing the Nature Boy's ego and insatiable appetite for the spotlight as the reason he grew up without a father. Flair would make his way to ringside in a rage. Suddenly, hot on his heels is the NWO. The group decimates Flair. We cut to a shot of the horseman who had been laid out backstage by the NWO. Just... As David is about to take his aggressions out on a prone nature boy, DDP emerges to make the save with a chair. Having had his own problems with Hogan, Rick and DDP would form an alliance. An anxious flair is granted a match along with DDP by the NWO with the stipulation that would be Hogan, Bischoff, and David in a handicapped no-holds-barred match with the horsemen banned from ringside. A steep price to pay for flair, he's willing to pay it. The tension at fe- is at a fever pitch leading to the encounter. At the pay-per-view, it would be an all-out brawl with David cowering for most of the bout. Bischoff is worn out by Flair as Hogan and DDP exchange hard rights at ringside. Just as Rick is poised to apply the figure four on Bush Bischoff, David nails Rick with a chair shot to the head. A now bloodied nature boy is vulnerable. Bischoff and David take their shots until DDP re-enters the ring, having subdued Hogan for the moment. Bischoff is nailed with a diamond cutter. David is cowering over a lifeless body of Ric Flair. As DDP stalks David, Hogan nails DDP with a chair to the back. Hogan then lands a leg drop for good measure and rolls DDP out of the ring. Rick then is nailed with a leg drop of his own. 
a jubilant David sloppily applies the figure four as the intimidated ref calls for the bell. Your winners, Hogan, Bischoff, and David Flair. As the trio celebrate and take their leave, DDP assists a confused Flair to his feet. DDP then slaps Flair and hits him with a diamond cutter of his own. DDP leaves via the crowd as we are all left scratching our heads. Yeah, I'm kind of scratching my head right now. Like, this is this is WCW 99 at its finest, and this is why I fucking hate it. That's fine. You'll you'll see the logic of it at the end. I don't know, man, because I'm trying to figure out what's going on because all of the big stars have pretty much been in already, except for Goldberg and probably Brett, which is upsetting to me. But we also are robbed of that wonderful barbed wire steel cage match between Flair and Hogan. Like, what are we doing here? I'm not. Oh, rats. Yeah, nothing. Nothing says uh, says a good time at the office like a barbed wire steel cage match. Between two almost 50-year-old men. Let's do it. Why not? Let's just, re- you know what? Let's just forget all this booking and just go back to the original. All right. I mean, why not? They're all clusterfucks. It's WCW. <laughs> um, all right. Whatever. You ready to move on? Yeah, man. Well, next up was a dog collar match between Perry Saturn and Chris Jericho. So we know this isn't there. So what do we have instead? The next match is the main event of the evening. Oh, shit. And- all right. Cool. And we are at the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Your champion, Goldberg, defending against Bam Bam Bigelow. All right, you are 100% trying to appease me right now, and I get it. Um, Yeah, all right. This is how you win me over with a Goldberg match, potentially. So let's go. Following Super Brawl, Goldberg is at a loss. Our champion opens Nitro with a promo indicating that Flair deserves a rematch, but the Nature Boy clearly has bigger fish to fry. After Goldberg inquires, who's next? Bam Bam Bigelow makes his way down to ringside. The Beast from the East suggests that he has smacked around NFLers in the past and that he can not only break Goldberg, but the streak as well. The match would be made official later on the, in the program. This week's, uh, sorry, the weeks leading to Uncensored, the two men would exchange promos that would end up in pull-apart brawls. At the pay-per-view, Bam Bam would attack Goldberg as he is engulfed in his pyro. The two would exchange bombs and use the set as a weapon. As the dust settles, Bam Bam has the upper hand while rolling Goldberg into the ring. A prone Goldberg is on the mat as Bigelow lands a diving headbutt for a near fall. The Beast from the East then goes from a moonsault Goldberg is able to evade the maneuver, rolling into the corner. Bigelow actually manages to land on his feet, only to turn into a spear. A fired-up Goldberg signals for the jackhammer. As Bigelow is hoisted up, Bam Bam shifts his body weight and counters into a reverse neckbreaker. A physically and mentally stunned Goldberg is treated to a greetings from Asbury Park for another near fall. A frustrated Bam Bam pulls the top turnbuckle pad off, presumably to ring Goldberg's bell. Bam Bam sends Goldberg sailing into the higher with a higher high. Jesus. Goldberg sends. Let me try this again. Wow. Bam Bam sends Goldberg sailing with a hard Irish whip into the exposed buckle. Bigelow builds up a head of steam and follows Goldberg into the corner only for Goldberg to move and hit the exposed buckle with his chin first. A dazed Bigelow is speared for the pin. Your winner, Goldberg. Following the match. DDP and Canyon make their way to ringside and lay out Goldberg. With a lifeless Goldberg on the mat, DDP and Canyon attend to Bigelow and raise Bam Bam's hands as we fade to black. We have now seen the formation of the Jersey Triad. Okay, so we see the formation of the Jersey Triad after Canyon kind of gets annoyed at Raven and DDP turns on Flair. So... How many storylines are we working at once right now? <laughs> well, what we're doing is we're gonna do these uh, we're gonna do these turns and then form the alliance at the end of the pay per view. And then what we get is, I guess you can break them off into you can do the Canyon Raven thing if you want. You can do Flair and uh, DDP if you want. You can do Bam Bam with whomever you want. I just kind of feel like. I like the idea of DDP winning the title in 99. So if we 
kind of do like a Goldberg versus DDP thing next month or what have you. Like, I don't know where you go with it, but I just kind of like the idea of you forming this alliance. And I tried to make sense of it through the, through the course of the show. See, the thing is, Tyrone, as you know, with these shows is that you kind of have to try to find like a spine, right? Like a through line. Mm -hmm. And I felt like with this one, I was trying to make more sense of what was going on because there was a lot of flux in WCW at this time. There was a lot of inconsistency. So if you kind of form everybody at the same time, you can tell the story then later on, on the following week's episodes of Nitro and Thunder that, you know, this was something that was devised the week leading into the pay-per-view. And this was the day that they all decided to kind of push the button. Right. So that's why Canyon took off. That's why, DDP did what he did to to Flair, having you know Flair be the one to take the L. He's pissed off and had enough, tired of you know having everybody's back in WCW, um, and then Bam Bam, of course, having the title opportunity has some backup now. So I kind of feel like that's where it goes. Now, I the one thing I can never remember right now: do we still have Goldberg streak intact, or did we end that? No, we still have it intact. Okay, so it hasn't ended yet. So here we are in, what is this, March of 99? Yeah, March of 99, and he's still undefeated. So now when he does lose, it'll be an even bigger deal, correct? I think so, yeah. I mean, we still have have some matches. See, the thing is, Tyrone, is we haven't even booked how Goldberg won the title yet. I think maybe we did. I don't remember. You booked Bash at the Beach 98, and I don't remember offhand if you had had Goldberg win the title at the Georgia Dome Nitro, like in Canon, or if you hadn't had that happen yet, I don't remember right now. But the bottom line is we haven't booked the latter half of 98, so we don't know whom Goldberg has faced at the Halloween Havoc. Whom he's Did you faced say Bash at, at the, the Did you say Bash at the Beach 98 or Great American Bash? Bash at the Beach 98. I had Goldberg beating Kurt Kurt Henning at Bash at the Beach 98. Was it for the title? Uh, I wish I had written that part down. <laughs> yeah, I have to go back and listen because I think I don't. I don't know, I right? Because we have probably haven't was probably so. Um, and I mean, if that's the case, then we've had Goldberg win the title just as he did in Canon, which is fine. I mean, it's a big, big time moment in history. So, so if that's how we've left it, then that's how we've left it. Yeah. Um, but going into the fall of 98, we don't know who's challenged Goldberg for that title. We don't know if it's been Hogan. We don't know who's if he's got his rematch. We don't know what's happened, right? Because we haven't booked it yet. So my thinking is, is that he's he's still on a streak. Okay, that's um, fine. I don't think that he should have. I mean, unless we decide to take it off him and then put it back on him again, I don't know. But I kind of feel like the streak, you keep that going now through 99. And then whomever actually beats him, whenever we do beat him, um, it'll be a big deal. All right. I can I can work with that. Yeah, that's totally fine. Um, yeah. yeah, I get what you did here. All the working pu- pieces to the puzzle makes sense. But it's just, it, you're, you're, you're trying to work with product that sucked. And you're trying to make sense of things that never always made sense. So I appreciate what you're doing. No, I, thank you. I appreciate that as well. I just... Uh, like you said, it, it, there's so many different different moving parts at the time, just like in any wrestling promotion. And at the same time, we also, because we're establishing our own multiverse here, we're starting to work off of the booking that we're doing because we're doing long-term storylines here. So um, it is interesting to see uh, where we will end up with WCW 99. I feel like we've already done a pretty good job of the latter half of the year coming up into the fall. We've booked already a few events. I think it was fall brawl, Halloween havoc, and then mayhem, which Tyler from the Canada seven booked for us. So, um, we're just trying to get to that point and kind of, as you said, get the puzzle pieces to fit. All right. Well, you, uh, you made sense to a degree of an uncensored show, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what am I doing next? Good. You're going to do a profile piece on Sony Ono. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's cool. No, I'm kidding. Uh, next week, you are, we are going to go back to the world of the Fed. Uh, I know that we've been very Fed heavy lately, but uh, I think that we've gone to WCW now. We're going to go back to it again next month. But 
I think our bread and butter has been established as the Fed, Tyrone. And so next week you're going to book a show that is arguably it's in my top five, maybe top three wrestling pay-per-views of all time. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but I absolutely love it. So I warn you, tread carefully when you rebook this. Next <laughs> week, you are going to uh, back to 1997. You are going to Rochester, New York, and you are booking WWF in your house, Revenge of the Taker. Okay. Um... I'm not gonna lie, I don't know if I've ever watched this show. It's maybe my it's my favorite in your house for sure. And it's what? maybe maybe my favorite pay-per-view of all time. What is the main? Okay, so we had two matches. Um the main event ended up being a rematch of Brett and Steve from WrestleMania 13. And we also had The Undertaker defend his championship against Mankind. I strongly encourage you, Tyrone, to go back and watch this show. It's an hour and 48 minutes. I strongly suggest you watch the pay-per-view and uh, see what you think of it. There are obviously some matches on there that weren't the greatest. Uh, Jim, we had... Up, uh, up right now. What's that? It, I'm looking it up right now, and I can already, I'm already excited to see Jesse James and Rockabilly go at it. Yeah, but I mean the opening. The Legion of Doom versus the Bulldog and Owen. What a great opener for a pay-per-view. So um, you have your working, working boots on next week, buddy, because I, uh, I'm going to be personally very upset if you just destroy this card. I hope you keep some of it the same. Uh, I'm very curious to see how you break apart this particular pay-per-view, Here's too, because you really left, left us on a cliffhanger based on uh, your WrestleMania 13 booking. If I'm not mistaken, Jerry Lawler is your intercontinental champion. He sure is. Now, here's my one question I have. I know we have to keep things the way that they were to a degree, but when I'm doing these in-your-house hour and 45-minute shows, do I have to keep the time length, or can I, can I make it a three-hour show if I wanted to, if I wanted to add things to this? Um. I think you could keep make it a little longer. I don't know if you want to do the three hour format only because they didn't do that until the ground zero pay-per-view in September of this year. So if you want to make it like a 210 or 220 or something, I think that would be fine. Okay, that's cool. Just uh, make sure that you mention that the pay-per-view providers have been fully notified so we don't get a WCW Halloween Havoc 98 uh, finish. Gotcha. Yeah, all right. I'm 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 okay with this one. This should be fun. I'm sure that... There will be some anger issues coming at me from you because this is one of your favorite shows, as you just said. And I have a tendency to bastardize a lot of these things. So we'll see what happens. You sure do, pal. But um, with that being said, I think we had fun this week. We uh, waxed nostalgic about a show that was a week old, which was WrestleMania 38. I truly enjoyed it. And uh, I think that uh, WCW is on the right track going into the spring. As you and I have talked about a few times, we have some exciting events coming up on tap and a couple of concept shows that we've been talking about behind the scenes that we might uh, unveil sometime in the next uh, month or two. And of course, we have, uh, you know, King of the Rings season coming up. We did 95 last year. We're going to be going through uh, 97 as well as 2004 to 2002 and then 99 WCW. So we have some fun stuff on tap. But until next week, Tyrone, where can our listening audience find us on social media? On Facebook at the Good Friends Better Enemies podcast, on Twitter at good underscore enemies, and on Instagram at good double underscore enemies. And as always, for all things Good Friends Better Enemies, Count It Out, cla or sorry, Classic Match Classroom, and Count It Out 7, head to countitout7.com. Also, ProWrestlingTees.com slash CountedOut7 if you want to get Mike and Tyler's faces on your chest. And who wouldn't? I certainly would want to do that myself. I think I'll go out and get myself a t-shirt at my earliest possible convenience. And for myself, for Tyrone, for WCW Uncensored 1999, for giant hands slapping full-grown men, and for the Shriners Hospital in Rochester, New York, you've been listening to the Good Friends, Better Enemies podcast. Bye.